Well, hi, everybody. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Of course, any questions, uh, you can put them in the chat box, like uh, Sebastian had uh, said, and uh, we'll try to answer them uh, towards the end there. So kill my camera here and go back to screen sharing. All right, so today's topic is uh, modern techniques and forensic facial identification. And so my goal and my objective today is to familiarize all of you with the historical uh, perspective and the future perspective on the techniques of the most commonly used forensic facial identification techniques. And these would be um, facial composites, which are the most used uh, forensic uh, facial identification tool that we see almost on a daily basis used by law enforcement agencies around the world. Uh, age progression, uh, facial approximation, commonly referred to as facial reconstruction or skull reconstruction, as well as the newest and latest uh, technologies in craniofacial superimposition. This is a topic, uh, forensic facial identification, uh, that there are a ton of studies going on in different areas and such, but I wanted to pick the most common uh, ones and talk about it uh, from a end user perspective. Um, I will tell you up front that um, I am not a scientist. I work with some uh, very smart people like the folks at Panacea and other uh, forensic anthropologists and scientists around the world. Um, I'm a practitioner. I'm an end user. I am look at it and approach it more uh, from an investigator standpoint because I actually have 31 years of active law enforcement experience, uh, 10 of those years as a detective. I retired in 2008 as a police sergeant, and I went on to uh, work with the Baltimore Police Department and set up their forensic facial imaging unit, and I worked for the Los Angeles Police Department. Actually, I still work for LAPD and Baltimore Police Department as their uh, forensic artist. So the way I got into this business was um, I, was an artist, uh, like most kids, a doodler, a drawer, a dreamer. I wanted to be a Disney animator because I lived close to Disneyland. And uh, my father was a career police officer, and there are always uh, police around my house hanging out, telling these great stories and such. And I just thought that'd be kind of a cool way to make a living, get to drive someone else's car and get to uh, arrest bad people and, and do something really good. Um, but once I got on the police force, I was always looking for new ways to, to lock people up. And I happened to see a, a facial composite on the news one night, and I had this aha moment where um, it all of a sudden came to me, this is a good way for me to uh, marry the two together, you know, love of art and, and public service. And I um, took my first class uh, with uh, LAPD's artist, uh, very famous for a lot of cases there in the city of Los Angeles. And he became a mentor and a friend. As a matter of fact, I lost contact with him for several years, and I was lucky enough to uh, meet up with him again uh, decades later, just probably about six months ago. And uh, he's still alive and kicking and about 80 years old. We got a chance to talk shop and you know where facial composites uh, have been and where they're going and the technology and such, which kind of help you know give birth to this topic of you know talking about modern techniques so let's go ahead and jump into facial composites first since that's the most used and the most popular um, again forensic art medium and I always like to take things back to a historical perspective like where did, before we go into the future with anything we have to know you know where we've been and have a, a good understanding of um, how we got here and in a way to help us take that and jump into the future. So, first of all, mug shots. You know, we rely as forensic artists on visual aids to help people. And again, you know, when you start talking about, you know, how do you create a, a facial composite and how do you, um, you know, interview an eyewitness, you know, there's no real wrong way to doing it unless you're doing something corrupt and making up evidence and, and drawing pictures of suspects and, and uh, you know, creating false evidence, so to speak. Um, so, you know, whether you use uh, pencil and paper, whether you use pastels, watercolors, inks, however you draw, however you create facial images, you might be a portrait artist or whatever. Um, the real art in all this is the interview. And so, you know, we use mug shots and visual aids and just anecdotally, just as a historical uh, micro history here, the, the first mug shot was invented in 1988 by Alphonse Bertillon, who was a anthropologist and the chief and the chief of france's judicial id services he really um paved the way for you know a lot of different 
uh, forensic identification techniques, um, but it was the mugshot, the, the profile and the frontal picture, uh, which um, has served law enforcement quite well you know, over, the, uh, over the past century and, and then some, um, as well as being a, a great visual aid for, for us. Because again, you know, I use uh, mug shots and facial identification catalogs in my work to help stimulate people's memories. Because again, uh, a lot of people can only remember and they can only tell you so much and we're such visual creatures anyway. Oftentimes people can't necessarily tell you what a person looked like but they can show you and reference certain facial features. Um, I've had people reference movie stars, uh, popular singers and such when I start doing facial composites. And, you know, we really owe a lot of this uh, to what we're doing to Alphonse Bertillion. So I want to give him a quick shout out there. So some of the first instances where forensic art, air quotes, has been used um, back in the Western days. Here's an example of an old Western poster, uh, this prolific bank robber, uh, train robber, robbed anything pretty much that had money back in the day. I think 1877 was when this wanted poster was put out, was Black Bart. And you can see the, the trench coat, the boots, the shroud over his face, and that distinctive hat. And this was a, something that, you know, back in the day they, you know, they used to, you know, give that visual aid. It's not an exact likeness. There's no color in it. There's, there's no texture, but you get an idea, the, the gestalt, as they would say, the overall appearance, when this guy shows up and walks through the door, you, you probably, you're probably going to want to throw your hands up right away because you've seen this poster and now you've associated that with Black Bart. No different today than uh, the full body drawing here, the famous Zodiac Killer here in San Francisco, California, that terrorized um, the state for um, back in the 1970s, and to this day has never been caught, but this... Uh, full body picture of him because um, the, very, the first images of him was when he would approach his, uh, his victims and they were able to um, get this description of him from one of the uh, surviving eyewitnesses and such. So some, sometimes again, it's, a, it's a, a type of forensic art, it's not necessarily the facial composite, but again, just to kind of show you there's, you know, sometimes, you know, the, it's better to get the whole picture than than just the face and you get the face with the with a body shot like this again it's it's a very powerful very powerful tool so again just some uh, earlier historical perspectives on and how some of these things are used uh, some people think that it's um, about the face i can't tell you how many mask drawings i do these days especially when it's a distinctive looking mask uh, sometimes all people see are the eyes and the eyes really tell us a lot about somebody especially their their identification this is the first documented use of a police sketch in 1881 over in the UK, uh, Percy Lefroy Mapleton. It's a really long story, but the bottom line was is that there was actually somebody that knew this person and described him to a newspaper artist. And this uh, picture went out in the in the news. It was widely circulated in the UK. Got a lot of false leads, but it's like anything with uh, any type of facial image or composite you put out. Um, even if it's a wanted fugitive who's known, you put a mug shot out, you're going to get a lot of false IDs. A lot of people, um, you know, you could have a case, a, a crime that happened in Los Angeles, and you put a picture out, whether it's a composite or a national mug shot of a fugitive, you know, where people are going to see him up in Canada. They they were on vacation in, in Mexico and, and swore they saw this person. Uh, but ultimately, um, Percy was arrested. And uh, this was in 1881, and it was the first documented use of a police composite sketch. So, you know, back in the day, they didn't necessarily have trained police sketch artists. Um, for example, uh, one of the earliest uses here in the United States was a, a terrorist bombing um, in on Wall Street in the financial district in 1920. You can see the composite of this person. Um, certainly had some scary looking big eyes, but uh, back in the day, you know, whether it was Percy Lefroy Mapleton in 1881 or this uh, Wall Street bomber in 1920, uh, they didn't have trained composite sketch artists. They just pretty much grabbed anyone who could wield a pencil and was, was pretty good. And it was typically uh, editorial cartoonists and people who worked for the newspaper. You know, they would sit down and take a description from, from people, but they didn't necessarily have um, a lot of the training that we have today uh, in terms of, you know, how to... Um, interview eyewitnesses, you know, victimology, 
uh, investigative techniques and strategies in terms of how these composite sketches would be used, but they did the best they can. It's like anything else, you know, who, who can draw? Well, my kid can draw. Okay, great. You know, bring him down to do, do a composite. It was kind of one of those things. So, but it led the way for uh, police composites to be a staple of, of major investigations throughout the world. And, and I always tell people that it's rare that you won't find a major case that somewhere in that case file that there's going to be a composite sketch because they're not necessarily used and they're not necessarily um, distributed widely. I was having a you know a conversation with Sebastian before this um, before we started. I said that you know a lot of my work never sees the light of day. Um, you never you know the composite sketches you see typically in the media are going to be um, either really heinous cases. Uh, there's a lot of community pressure to solve these crimes. Um, you know, they've run out of investigative leads, you know, and, uh, you know, they've, they've distributed them in-house and the, the regular beat cops and detectives don't recognize them. So they're either the first thing done or the last thing. I've, I've had, I think I've had, um, I've had sketches where they call me right away. And as soon as the, the sketch goes to the media, uh, they have the suspect identified, I think, uh, I think for me, I think the fastest was um, I walked out and after a case, I handed the detective and he said, hey, I know who this guy is. And he did. In fact, he was he was identified by the, the victim and, and uh, placed into custody right away. And I've had cases go cold you know, for up to eight years and such. So um, and I've had I've had sketches where they call me in six months later after they've you know run out all, all their leads and the first words out of the victims I would or I'm sorry the victim I wouldn't mouth is I wish they had called me the first day because they 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 start losing confidence in their memory but these sketches ultimately the ones I'm going to show you become the signature images for these cases so most people are familiar with the Unabomber, uh, 1978 to 1996 when he's finally caught um, in the in the United States here. Um, and just to give you a worldwide global perspective, uh, this was a famous serial killer, the Red Ripper from uh, Rostov in, in Russia, who uh, terrorized the country from 1978 to 1990. Uh, Son of Sam in New York City, 1976. The Night Stalker, this was um, drawn by my mentor, Fernando uh, Ponce, a former LAPD artist. He was one of the first ones to use color. He used uh, oil-based uh, uh, pastel sticks and uh, he studied color quite a bit and um, so he, you can see these very nice rich skin tones on uh, Richard Ramirez. You guys have never watched um, The Night Stalker on Netflix. Uh, it's terrifying. It's a great documentary and um, uh, I was really you know proud to be taught by this person who did this uh, sketch. And this was a, a gang rape uh, suspects in Mumbai, India in 2013. Uh, these uh, gang rapists uh, set upon some journalist and attacked her. And I could go on and on and on. I mean, um, you know, India is a big user of facial composites. Uh, you know, the Philippines, the Philippine National Police, uh, they, they publish a lot of facial composites. And so, again, it's, it's probably the most used and one of the first, uh, you know, forms of, of facial composites or forensic identification tool. Um, I mean, this is kind of a global perspective. You can see how long, you know, we've been, we've been at it now. Now, along the way, um, there were some clever companies trying to find a way to you know, monetize the process, which is, I don't have a problem with being a business owner myself. Um, but, you know, they did the best they could back then to, because the goal was, because they recognized the fact there weren't a lot of facial composite artists available or any qualified ones, they thought that it'd be easier just to train, you know, police detectives and police personnel, or I mean, anyone that wanted to grab this uh, kit and start putting together faces. So one of the first ones was uh, Jacques Penry photo fit uh, over in the UK, again, the 50s and, 50s and 60s. And they had this reference book, you'll see the, the four ring binder there and they had different uh, facial references in there. And a lot of the knock uh, on these systems is because, you know, people remember faces holistically uh, as a whole, so to speak, versus just, you know, being pieced out, you know, the uh, individual eyes, individual noses, individual mouths and such. Um, 
but that was the only that was the only way they they did it. And they've got a few systems that'll assemble a variety of choices for people to to go through. It's almost like a funnel system where you know you describe somebody and they they put together maybe you know 10, 15 different faces and you just kind of refine them from there and it's and then the next iteration there's maybe 10 and five two and then you get that one per, the one that's most consistent with the eyewitness's memory and refine them from there but back then it was just the flip books and of course you could see this the strips uh of different facial features there the nose the mouth and they kind of fit them together and you can see in the upper right it's kind of a crude puzzly looking type of face uh, but again it got the job done back then uh, Smith and Wesson Identikit was introduced by uh, Hugh McDonald, an LA police uh, crime scene technician back in 1958, and it was widely used. Um, I mean, I we I found an old one in our equipment room when I first started in police work in 1977. And again, you can see the acetate um, cards there that have different facial features on there. So you know, you'd go out, you'd go through and you'd, you know, lay these things out and the victim would go through and pick them out and you'd lay them on top of one another, like, you know, building it like make, like making a sandwich, so to speak. You know, you got the, you got the one piece of bread, which is the face and you, you, this facial shape and you may go through and put all the, the ingredients, the, the meat, the lettuce, tomatoes and such, you know, the nose, the eyes, the mouth. And then that last piece of bread might be the hat or the hair or something like that. Paper clip it together. And if you wanted to draw a mustache on there, they gave you some grease pen and it looked like like cat whiskers a lot of times uh, when people draw um, you know, those things on there. Fairly crude, but again, it, it did the job. Again, you here's a, a picture of the different uh, acetate cards there. So here's an example of a successful use of Identikit. Uh, this was a LA Orange County case here in California and here in the United States. It just shows one of the successful uses of it. And again, you know, I've seen drawings that are very, that, are, that would be considered very crude and childlike, and they wind up resulting in the identification of a suspect. Um, and then you've got the identikits. Again, you can say what you want about them. Um, you know, th they did the job, um, you know, back then. So the whole idea was, is to get a general likeness of the suspect. You're not gonna get a, a feature for feature match an exact match and you know, some are closer than others but even if someone sees one facial feature in that identikit or freehand sketch that sparks someone's recognition and, and they make the call to police or they you know submit a tip through a tip line or send an email to the police then it's done its job now in 1984 uh, the fbi had recognized that um, maybe it'd be a good idea to train a bunch of artists throughout the United States and then eventually throughout the world. So what they did in 1984 is they uh, gathered about a dozen of us. I was part of that group and they uh, brought us back to the Academy of Quantico, Virginia to sit down and hash out a curriculum. You know, what do forensic artists need? What should we teach in this course? And it gave birth to what eventually became a two and then three week course. It was very, very popular. It was There was a waiting list for the course. Um, I think that um, I went to the initial meeting in 1984, and I didn't go to the course myself until 1993. Um, but again, um, the whole idea was is you know they had a battery of artists there at the FBI that they would that they would send literally all over the world if there was a uh, you know a, a prolific bank robbery or a certain a kidnapping in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, Des Moines, Iowa, you know somewhere remote in the United States, you know big cities. You know, they'd, fly, they'd jump on a plane, they'd fly out there and, and do the sketch and fly back. And so, uh, or they would, you know, they would, uh, they had a, a, an eyewitness interview form that the agent would fill out with the eyewitness. They'd go through a book of photographs they, they, they were, that were coded. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, the investigator, the agent would fill that out, fax it back to the artist. They'd open up their own book. They'd draw the eyes and noses and such. Create a, create a composite, and then they would fax that back to the agent, and then the eyewitness victim would make the recommended changes. They'd fax that back, and they'd fax back and forth until they finally come up with something the eyewitness was happy with. So they figured if they trained somebody, they trained artists throughout the United States that work for law enforcement agencies, they could just pick up the phone and call on them to, um, to do a sketch and it worked out pretty well until unfortunately the um money ran out and congress stopped funding it and so um they don't have their their course anymore unfortunately 
Now, you know, again, you know, back then they taught us with, you know, how to draw. Most people drew with pencils. And that, you know, the uh, the ebony design pencil right there was my favorite pencil. Actually, that's a picture of the pencil I used for years. Um, I was a pencil guy. You know, I like drawing um, with, you know, monochromatic black and white grayscale uh, sketches, which you can see kind of ghosted in the background there. Um, and this is my this is my pretty much my my go kit. I mean, I, I didn't always take the electric pencil sharpener with me. It's kind of bulky, but you know, get the idea. You know, pen, pencils, paper, um, you know, gummy racer, uh, horsehair brush. That you know, take it in a, in a go bag with my facial identification catalog and, and hit the road. Um, when I first started, I mean, I we didn't we weren't taught the value of and the power of, of visual references and facial references to help create images and such. So if, when I was a detective, um, when I had a victim come in, I'd grab a piece of uh, copy, Xerox paper out of the copy machine, grab a number two pencil off someone's desk, make sure it was sharp, and, and go to work. Now, recently, I think everyone's heard of an iPad, everyone's heard of a Surface. And of course, there's the different brands of tablets out there. Uh, now people have figured out that uh, maybe it would be um, maybe it would be wise to switch to a, a digital medium. And again, it's not for everybody because it can get it can get to be expensive. There are some uh, free open source sketching programs out there, and of course, you know you can get you know tablets for anywhere between you know twenty five dollars to I think the highest uh, price Wacom one now is their new Cintiq Pro 27, which is like, I think, almost $4,000. So depending upon you know, how much money you have to invest and in, in, in where you're at in terms of your art or photography career will pretty much lead you to you know where you start. So, um, but I think most people have iPads these days. So, you know, get yourself an Apple Pencil and download a, a program like Procreate and, and you're ready to go because again, we don't sit in the office and draw all the time. I mean, everyone has this vision and, and the movies are propagated and TV shows and such that we sit in a police station, we sit in a quiet room and we create facial images in this quiet controlled environment. And that can be farther from the truth. I mean, I've sat in the back of detective cars, um, interviewing informants and criminals. I've, I've been, you know, led up the back stairs in the FBI after hours to, uh, interview um, high value secret informants. Um, I've been on shooting scenes when you still smell the gun smoke in the air. So they can be really chaotic and such. So, you know, the iPad and the Surface Pro, if you're in, in a digital medium now, you know, you're, you can take that out in the uh, field with you. And of course, you know, if you are lucky enough to, to draw in the station, um, that's good too. I mean, when I was in Baltimore, I, you know, I had a, well, thought I had a controlled environment. I, you know, I had an office and yeah, and it was out of the way. And sometimes when I had to go down to the detective's office, uh, you know, they were, it was pretty chaotic, especially in a, a city that's pretty busy and such. It always has something going on. Uh, but these are some of the digital tools that people are using now. Um, I myself went digital in 2015. I just felt that it was convenient. It was the way of the future. It made me a better artist. I mean, I certainly, with some of these programs, I mean, you, they got, you know, oil painting, watercolor, gouache, I mean, chalk, pastels, whatever you want to do. And instead of carrying a suitcase full of all these art materials, you just, you know, bring them up in your iPad and your Surface Pro. And again, if you use a PC or whatever, you know, at the station and such. So um, I use both. I actually have a, um, a couple tablets here in my offices and I've got an iPad when I go out in the field, which is rare these days because uh, um, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But again, the, the nice, the, the thing I like with um, going digital, I think it makes me a better artist. I think it extends the range of my capabilities. And so I can, I can create drawings that look like drawings like here on the far left or on the far right, something that looks more photographic or like the middle, somewhere in between that, that looks photographic, but has an art feel to it and such. So, and again, you know, even though it's quote, the, it's not about the art, I mean, you want to draw something that looks more than just a stick figure because you don't want people paying more attention and, and, and making fun of your drawing. You don't want to w wind up on the on the local news as you know ten worst police sketches and such. You want something that people are going to pay attention to and, and talk about and be terrified of because they they that they can't keep their eyes off it because it it looks 
like a human being. It looks like a person. They can something they can relate to. You don't want to make it too photographic looking because then they think it's a mugshot of the person. So, uh, but digital gives you that range, whichever way you want to go and helps you create that signature style because face it, I mean, there's a lot of great work going on there in, 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 in DNA sequencing and all these equations that go in these algorithms for these different programs and such, but it's not sexy. You can't put that out on the news. You can't put that out and have people, you know, go look for this, go look for this. They, they wouldn't understand it. But these images become signature images. That's why when you when you see people wearing here in the United States, at least you see people wearing a hoodie and aviator glasses, they go, oh, you look like a Unabomber because of the sketch. They make that association. Now, um, because of uh, COVID, and I was doing this before COVID, I started back in, again, 2015, you know, using a digital medium to create my composite sketches, but I also, um, started working remotely uh, for Baltimore Police Department and several other agencies around the world uh, from my offices here in Los Angeles. And I found the way to do that was to go to a platform, a, a, a conferencing a communication platform, you know, Zoom, uh, you know, Google Meet. I mean, I, I don't have enough fingers on my hands and toes to name all the ones that have popped up. Everyone's got their favorite ones. I use GoToMeeting. I use zoom i use google meet um, a lot of it depends upon you know how, how many how much how many tools you need uh, because you've got that screen sharing function like what we're doing now and you can share your screen you can share your your um, visual information catalogs you can they can watch you draw real time and make the adjustments and such and then when you're done you can wrap it up and and uh, put this uh, attach the sketch to an email and send it to the detective um, I'm I'm in the Los Angeles metro area, but I mean, on a good day with no traffic, I can be to downtown Los Angeles in an hour. If I have to go up to the valley, north part of LA, two hours. So that's two hours they have to wait for me to draw and then come back and email them the, the uh, sketch. And now, um, you know, they can call me and they can get their sketch done and to them in, in an hour sometimes, an hour to two hours. So it makes it real convenient and so you know after we got used to that and COVID hit um you know and everyone learned that you know you could work remotely and you could do things you know via um, these digital uh, communication platforms like zoom everyone everyone just refers to zoom you know zoom meeting because everyone got so used to it because that was the predominantly used uh, conferencing tool um, then people weren't so tethered to their computers because people had computers and they had tablets and such iPads they use. So um, now uh, most of my, you know, crime victims and eyewitnesses, um, I have my meetings with them on their phone. So if a person comes to LA and they're the victim of a crime, they're vacationing and they go back home to France or they go back to New York City, doesn't matter. I just call them up, link up with them on a meeting on their cell phone. They see what's on the screen here, which is my, you know, Corel Painter screen, and they can see the sketch right there. So, um, so in that realm, you know, you're not so tethered and tied to, um, you know, driving and being in the same room, which is a lot for law enforcement to wrap their head around because unfortunately law enforcement, and I spent over half my life in law enforcement, love being a cop, Love the whole thing. I still watch cops and in, in, in police videos, and that. Um, but they're very slow to change. So when you tell them, "Well, we're going to do this remotely," and their first question is, "Well, don't you need to be in a room with them?" I mean, to like see their facial reaction, see them cry. I mean, um, no, I can see that on screen. I can hear it on the phone. Um, that emotion doesn't change. And then, of course, the biggest question whenever I walk out of a room, uh, detectives often say, "Well, what do you think? You think they're..." Be honest and my my answer to them is I'm, I'm i'm here for the sketch i can give you some of my impressions but if you think they're lying i shouldn't be in the same room with them i shouldn't even be here so a digital solution tethered with and tied to a remote solution is very convenient for everybody because the police love it because they don't have to make the appointments they don't have to go down and drive the victim to the station the victim loves it because they don't have to leave their house in, at night and they don't have to worry about parking downtown and walking to the police station becoming I mean, a crime victim again. They're in a safe environment. There's something, there's somewhere where they're comfortable 
and that's what you want. You want, you know, you want them as comfortable as possible, get the optimum amount of information from them. So it really kind of plays into a lot of things. So now, again, now that we're in this digital age and software and such is a, is a solution for everything, um, that includes, uh, you know, software driven solutions for creating facial composites. The idea is, you know, getting more people involved in the games, um, for lack of a better term, you know, most agencies, if they have a sketch artist, they might have one, they might have two. But those people are going to get promoted. They're going to get retired. They're going to retire. They're going to take vacations. They get days off. You don't want to be scrambling around for a sketch artist and you need one. So the thought was, we'll create a software program. Um, and so you can teach anybody how to create a composite. All they have to do is be able to interview somebody. So um, Smith & Wesson was probably the first, um, one of the first people jump into the software game. They digitized their identikit, so they took everything out of the wooden box and, and put it online. And then, of course, you know, faces became really popular, and America's Most Wanted, the crime, the popular crime show back in the 1990s, 2000s, um, you know, helped promote it. And I did some road work with them um, because I thought I had some real promise. But then you learn that you know all these, you know, a lot of these software programs have limitations as well. And um, the, the you know the first knock on it was you know it wasn't supported by police sketch artists because you know they they thought they could do better and and in some cases they could you know uh, but at the same time uh, as things progressed and the systems got better you know you had something that looked like a a traditional sketch this is a screenshot from my company software the or SketchCut Facial Composite the software app. I wanted to get back to an old school look. Like I wanted to get back to something that looked like a sketch, looked like it was sketched by a, a police sketch artist. And so, whereas at one time when police sketch artists said, well, you know, uh, there's no software program that can do what my pencil can do. That might've been true at one time, but nowadays with these software uh, applications paired with a program like Photoshop, uh, that has facial warping tools and face aware tools and such. Um, now, with a click of a mouse, uh, it it's kind of a moot point because they they can do just as well and be as just as effective as a sketch artist without having any artistic talents themselves. Now, of course, the limitations with our software program, as well as many others out there in the market, is there's no profile. Uh, it's just a frontal image only. So, you know, you'd still, if the eyewitness saw the person from a three quarter or profile view, um, they would have to, um, you know, call in a sketch artist. Future considerations, DNA. DNA is a, a big thing. Uh, friends of genealogy, uh, you know, creating the snapshots, uh, you know, the Parabons doing uh, DNA composites now. Uh, pretty expensive. No one's really quite sure how they do it. It's proprietary. Uh, it has not been peer reviewed. Uh, and all they can glean at this point is uh, skin color, eye color, hair color, freckles, their ancestry, the face shape, and some other type of uh, machine learning tools and genetic trait reference databases that they hold. And they do use their forensic artists to kind of put all this together and fill in the blanks. Uh, again, you know, it gets a signature out image out there. Whether you rely on that or not, or whether you believe it can be done or not, the bottom line is it gets people talking about the case. So um, that's always a good thing. Uh, CCTV cameras uh, are more prevalent now than ever. Everyone has an iPhone, uh, some type of phone with a camera taking pictures, taking videos. Uh, most buildings have them now uh, for some reason. Uh, oftentimes, they're going to show a, an image from up and away like this, so you really can't see much of a face there. Got kind of a distinctive haircut, and uh, I'm not quite sure who the robber is here, but uh, bottom line is, is you don't really have a good look at either of their faces and such. So, you know, I always argue for, um, you know, taking a picture like this of any distinctive clothing or hairstyles and pairing it with a good facial composite. So here's some videos of a sketch I did for a client. You know, I interviewed the eyewitness and, you know, taking these pictures and describing, uh, you know, what she remembered to kind of fill the blanks in, showing the things, to kind of clearing up this picture here, the composite. This is the, uh, the suspect on the right. Again, not an exact image, but close enough that, you know, someone recognized him and the police were able to arrest him. So age progression, 
one of the first AIDS progressions was done in Eaton, Eaton Paths in New York. He's missing from New York back in 1979. Uh, back in back at that time, you know, you had these black and white analog video type uh, digitizers and such. And, and so this was an AIDS progression on the right, uh, done in Ethan. And uh, that was out for a number of years. And of course, over the years, you know, you know, the, the uh, National Center for, for Missing Exploited Children, who I've had a long time association with, who trained me on age progressions, you know, found a way to leverage Photoshop and Photoshop's tools to do age progressions. And you get these really nice looking, uh, clear pictures now uh, with that. As far as the uh, future considerations, as far as the push buttons, there's some age progression apps out there, but they don't really account for a lot of the growth and such that goes on in the face. You can see this picture of this little girl. I went ahead and just put it in the aging and made her quote, put push the old person button. And it made her young face look old, like she had some sort of dwarfism or some sort of aging, um, accelerated aging type of, of illness. Um, so um, I think they're good. I think, I think they have their place, uh, but just, to rely on just a push button system. Um, I don't think that they're there yet. And again, there's dozens of them out there. They're mostly novelty items, um, but they're out there. Facial approximation, uh, you know, better known as skull reconstruction or facial reconstruction. Um, the way that a lot of people um, started and the way a lot of people are still doing it is um, with clay. And the primary sculpting tools uh, for this is basically the hands and the thumb. Uh, this is a picture of pretty much what they call the American method. Uh, you put your tissue dump markers on this on the skull. You lay strips of clay in. You fill those between the strips of clay in with other clay. You know, pop some prosthetic eyeballs in there along the way. Sculpt it to where you get this nice finished look. Then you also have what's uh, taught over in England at the University of Dundee in their Master's of, of Forensic Art program. Uh, up, up top the Manchester method where you put your tissue dump markers on there, you put the prosthetic eyes in, you start laying muscles, the muscles of the face in, and then you put the skin on top and then of course render it out. And then this is the same Manchester method below uh, panel C here uh, using um, a digital facial reconstruction solution. So traditional, this is the beginning phase of your uh, traditional clay reconstruction. And then, of course, your mid phase. And if you have to walk away from this thing for like a week or two because you're really busy or you go on vacation or you're just doing composites mainly, you don't have time to get back to it. When you get back to it, you're going to typically, unless you've got really good photographs, you're going to forget what's underneath. And of course, the you know what's under the uh, what's under the hood um, is really important in terms of you know how the body style um, you know comes together. So that's the nice thing about um, digital this is a project i'm working on right now you know you've got all the tissue depth markers all the the eyeballs all the all the markers and such you got the nose armature here um and with the traditional method you know you're working straight from the skull or if you're lucky enough you've got a laser scanner and a 3d printer you can print it out and then be working and looking at the original skull this is a I put I put this high cost three D laser scanning solution. This is probably about sixty five seventy thousand U S dollars. Not many people can afford that. Um, then you got your mid range precision three D laser scanners, probably about twelve thirteen thousand dollars for this one. And then you got a low cost high res five hundred dollar uh, handheld. You know, although you can put on a tripod. And this is some of the this is a scan I did of the skull. Uh, using that small handheld $500 unit. Again, very detailed, um, but you don't necessarily need really detailed. Um, you just have to find what works for you. But again, I, you know, when I first started, you know, we would, you, you'd walk out back the uh, morgue or the coroner's office and there'd be an anthropologist boiling skulls in a, a bucket of hot, you know, a pot of hot water try and clean them off or they'd be in a, a beetle box and beetles be eating the flesh off or they'd give me a skull and I'd find it wasn't all cleaned off yet so I'm bleaching in my backyard and such and, and now with all those the laser scanning solutions and such I, I can get a, I can get a scan or take a scan and then clean them up uh, digitally I don't have to get my hands dirty or risk 
catching anything. Uh, photog photogrammetry is probably the lowest cost, high quality uh, 3D scanning replacement. Uh, you get an inexpensive, like a $20 turntable, battery powered turntable. Uh, get some lighting or be in a well lit room and set your camera I, iPhone up on a, on a, on a um, tripod and start shooting pictures. And there's free photogrammetry software out there to stitch these pictures together into a nice high quality 3D image. And uh, again, there's other programs out there that you can use, uh, like you know ZBrush, Blender, um, to bring them into and create a 3D model, and you can start sculpting on it. This is one of the most reliable ones, the easiest ones. Um, if your coroner's office and medical examiner's office has um, access to a um, CT scanner, then they can just um, send you DICOM files. You know, I have a file sharing service so they can upload all the, all the DICOM pictures to me. And then I can just put them in a DICOM reader like this and then create a 3D skull. And then again, you know, using the tools, some of these clipping tools up here to clip all the uh, artifacts off. And uh, then I can create a, a 3D OBJ file, STL file of this and, and bring it into uh, my 3D sculpting program and, and away you go. And, you know, to some other modern tools. And again, if we're talking about moving away from a, a hand, you know, sculpted clay where you use your thumbs and your hands. Now, you know, we're using desktop haptic devices, devices, which is a real popular tool if you're using a system like uh, a Geomagic uh, Freeform uh, to sculpt. The haptic device, the arm, like it's 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 really the weirdest thing because all of a sudden that stylus will stop midair and you're getting resistance and you look on this on the screen. And your stylus on the screen is actually pushing on clay, so you're hitting clay. So then you can use it to sculpt, and so that thing is moving in the air. You're not really touching anything in in the actual physical world. You're touching something in the digital world. It's really kind of like an augmented reality without having the goggles and such. So um, st pen stylus, if you use ZBrush or Blender, some of the other, uh, you know, Mudbox, Maya, some of the other digital programs out there. I use a, I have a, a Wacom 32 Cintiq, a lot of a lot of real estate there in my screen, and I got a uh, couple different styluses, a 3D stylus and, and the 2D stylus. And here's the uh, part of the apparatus I use. I got my 3D model up there. I can start putting the, the tissue depth markers on here in, in Cinema 4D. You can see that. And the nice thing about this is that with the traditional method, you cut. Like, I mean, anyone has ever done it, you know, you're cutting erasers you know, to, to different, uh, your different landmark, facial landmarks. And, um, and if you decide that, you know, you need to go, you know, you need to fill the face out a little bit or, you know, make it, make it a little more gray. So you got to recut and re-glue tissue depth markers. With programs like this, you can create libraries. You can create libraries of tissue depth markers depending upon whose study you're using. And every country has, a study on you know tissue depths and their population. I use Stefan's. Um, it's pretty much an aggregate of you know males, females, you know different populations worldwide, and uh, you can uh, just change it easily with just you know popping in a different number and hitting enter, and, and it changes it. You can watch the tissue depth marker uh, change depth on your screen there. So. That's a nice thing. And of course, that when you talk about you know covering something up with clay, and again, this is another project I'm working on right now. Um, you can just use the um, having a brain freeze here. You can see you can you, you can see the you can see through the clay and you can see the skull below. So you can see the different um, bony uh, bony landmarks, things that don't necessarily you'd have a tissue depth marker associated with, but something that's going to influence the surface. So transparency tool that's what i'm looking for transparency tool so again another example of uh, being able to see through and, and see the clay below there's not really a solution uh, and you can even do the same method in, in 2d form there's no real solution yet for um for doing uh you know skull reconstruction uh digitally I've seen a lot of studies out there where they 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 create them you know using different algorithms and such but they're never finished products. They're always um, like kind of a generic head. So there's always that need for the artist to come in there and, and uh, you know, finish that up and do the, fin the, do the finish work and the detail work that's going to create that identity and, and spark that recognition. 
uh, craniofacial superimposition. It's not something new. Um, you can see the setup here. It's, it's, it seems rather elaborate, rather expensive. But basically, you're taking, um, you're using a couple different uh, mounted video cameras. You got your monitors, a, a video image mixing device, and video recorder to be able to film your 2D image, to film your skull, and then mixing those images together with the video mixer to be able to use the swipe tools and the transparency tools and such uh, to come up with, um, you know, to see how closely the skull matches uh, the face based upon different uh, landmarks, cran cranial landmarks and cephalometric landmarks uh, to see how they match up and such. So again, here's some of the uh, tools they, they use. I've seen it, again, I, I'm familiar with this process because it's, it's been around for a number of years. Um, it works. Uh, I think there's probably still people using it today. And here's a couple of uh, different examples with it. Here's more of a, a 2D, and you can. Uh, I've seen people use uh, Adobe Photoshop uh, as well. I had some. Um, I, I'd seen some pictures recently. Somebody using it, and again, it's it's your it's a static image, so you're really limited to the uh, the pictures that you have available, and being able to you know photograph the skull in the same position and such. So, and then of course, you have to make sure that you size the skull and the face properly. Um, you know, so you can make an accurate identification. Future considerations. Well, here we are with Panacea hosting um, my talk today, and I'm very excited to collaborate with them. Their um, their product, Skeleton ID, I think, in terms of uh, craniofacial superimposition and skull face overlay uh, tools, I think are a, a game changer in terms of uh, helping. Uh, you know people who are um, involved in anthropology, involved in, you know, uh, trying to identify disaster victims, um, you know, people, of, you know, people who suffer forced disappearances, war crimes, mass graves, even just, you know, unidentified bodies that, you know, where there's uh, no DNA um, or very limited DNA samples available, uh, or maybe dental, dental x-rays aren't there. You know, a lot of folks that, um, you know, suffer these, you uh, horrific crimes and, and such don't always, you know, go to dentists and such. So uh, this is basically taking all that video superimposition equipment and putting it into a software program with a uh, with all the tools and such to be able to do the transparencies, the swipes, uh, being able to uh, be being driven by um, artificial intelligence to be able to, uh, you know, help determine, um, you know, the likelihood and using likelihood ratios to, to help the end user make a determination of the person's identity. And uh, I've been using this and I found it to be a very, very uh, good tool. Um, here's a, another slide showing, uh, you know, the, the skull input and some of the, where the, some of the cranial uh, landmarks are, are placed. And again, you know, some of the transparency tools that you can use and then of course, you know, some of the uh, being able to match the markers and such that you can make a determination uh, or it helps make a determination uh, on if in fact uh, that person's uh, the same person or not. So very exciting. And I know they're developing a lot more stuff. So um, really happy to be collaborating with them because again, I think that um, we talk about other considerations. I'm going to talk about AI in just a moment. Um, you know, facial recognition is something that, you know, we have to deal with. Um, when I say we have to deal with is something that you know forensic artists are going to become involved with. Again, you know, when, when I first started out, I was just a sketch artist. I mean, I just I did the composite sketches and that was it. And the more I learned about the discipline of forensic art, which became be called forensic facial imaging in, in some quarters, um, the more I wanted to learn. So it took me into you know facial approximation, it took me into age progression, it took me into doing a uh, forensic facial comparison analysis one to one, and of course you can't ignore these technologies that come up. So here's an example of you know facial recognition, and the um, and the ranking that the the software gives them in terms of you know, is this person any one of these person and which ones could they be, and then you know then you're asked to do the one to one comparison. And here's a, a picture of a uh, one of the uh, most famous prison breaks in the world in 1962 escape from Alcatraz prison in, in uh, San Francisco, California. And uh, so um, 
you know, you'll get cases where you get, you know, old photographs that compare to, you know, newer photographs. They're outside of the realm of facial recognition software programs, but you may still be asked from a detective who gets a hit in facial recognition, could this be the same person? Forensic video, you know, another consideration. Forensic video is really great at telling the story, but it doesn't tell everything. Um, but I look at it for the facial recognition value. In other words, can we glean a suspect's face from that? What can we do with that? And um, if you look at some of the software out there, you look at see this um, tinted window on the left here, and using that software and uh, the algorithms they built in their artificial intelligence, it's able to get rid of a lot of this and, and show the face behind the, the tinted window. Here, you can't really glean much of the face from here, but now using the filters and such, now you got a, a better idea of, of what these people look like. So, you know, while we may not be interested as forensic facial identification consultants, experts, forensic artists, whatever you want to call yourself, the fact of the matter is there's there's a video processing software out there and things that you may become involved with and may want to get involved with to extend your capabilities for your agency and such. So um, it's not going to be, you know, when you talk about artificial intelligence, which is, you know, we can't ignore artificial intelligence because it's something that's creeping into every area of our life and affecting different industries and such. Um, for facial ID consultants, experts, whatnot, friends of Gardas, you're going to have to face, um, you know, up here is the um, logo for face app. You know, it's, a, it's the one that they use for, that can age a face. And it does a pretty good job. It does okay. Um, but it's not the it's not the end all. It's not going to replace a forensic artist. A pixel up. Uh, it it's another one that uh, can can repair photos and and make uh, you know take the blur out of some photos. Here's a you know generate your own. Uh, you'll see this on Instagram quite a bit. And I mean I I could go slide after slide after slide. There are so many out there these days. I mean pick whichever one you want. I mean I I use them. Um, I just started using. Uh, this uh, software program by uh, Topaz Labs because I, I get so many small pictures or blurred out pictures and such um, that, you know, they've got an algorithm here where um, the artificial intelligence fills in the gaps and help bring the pixels together. And, and in some cases, you know, you, you don't want to mess with the picture too much because you don't want the algorithm to affect the, the true appearance of the person. But you can see here in the split screen that I don't see, you know, it doesn't appear to me that there's any uh, image manipulation, degradation, or any change in this person's overall appearance identity. Um, you know, Photoshop, for you Photoshop users, you know, they've gotten into the game. They've got their, if you go under filters, you'll see a, a selection for neural filters. And these are all AI driven. And there's a whole host of them here. Um, you can age a face, you can restore a photo. Um, you can do a lot of things. So um, it's here and it, it can't be ignored. So uh what are my thoughts uh well first of all this is it was just, uh, what i consider to be like a quick and dirty overview of you know forensic facial imaging because there's other topics that i didn't discuss um and of course you know we could talk about software we could talk about apps all day long um, but everyone has their favorite one and um, what i use and what i really like using uh, some other person says yeah that's fine but i like to use this um, you know, uh, some people like, you know, Wacom tablets, some people like XP pen better, you know, you could go on and on. There's probably about a dozen different tablet makers, uh, you know, drawing techniques. Some people like, you know, photorealistic, some people like, you know, just, you know, sketchy. So, you know, what's the right answer? There isn't one. So this is a, 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 a like I said, a pretty quick and dirty overview, but some of my personal thoughts, now I've, I've been in the business now for 43 years. You know, like I said, I started out with a, nothing more than a number two pencil and a piece of uh, Xerox paper. And now I've graduated to using, I mean, I mean, my office, I'm, again, I've, I've invested a lot of uh, technology. It looks like the Starship Enterprise um, here, but um, I want to use the best tools that make the most sense for my clients. And, and, and I can tailor specific techniques, specific software equipment to that specific case. So I'm, I'm very lucky in that regard. How I view artificial intelligence, I don't, I'm not afraid of it. 
I don't look at it taking my job. <clears throat> I look at it as a versus a, a, a total solution versus a, a tool that creates a more efficient workflow. And the way I look at it is, for me, it's a more efficient workflow. I will use AI tools to get me to a certain point. And when, that, and when I get to that point, that's when my artistic skills and working with you know, scientists or experts and such um, comes into play. Because again, I see myself as being a practitioner. You know, uh, you know the, the, the people smarter than me study this. Um, they do all the, the, the laboratory work and the testing, which, you know, again, you know, testing is fine, experiments are fine, but you, you, it's really truly hard to duplicate, you know, um, field work in the laboratory. So I like to try to put this stuff uh, into play, um, for lack of a better term. And so all these tools I just use as a, you know, as a way to, to get to where I need to be. So AI. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. Use it. Uh, you know, use it as a, a workflow, a shortcut, you know, to, so you can, you know, quit spending more time on what your skills are versus the process. Which brings us to question number two: Are friends of artists a dying breed? Absolutely not. Again, there are things that an artist can do that no software can do. For example, you know, with um, with uh, facial recognition, you know, again, these algorithms are able to pick people out of a crowd and give you likely candidates. So you hear all these stories about, you know, facial recognition being responsible for wrongful arrests. It's not facial recognition, it's the process, it's the detective, it's the human element. But the human element is needed because, you know, people, studies have shown that, you know, people are, are better at recognizing, um, you know, than these uh, out, uh these uh, facial recognition software programs are but you need that to to, to take a, a candidate pool of like ten thousand people maybe down to 10 people and then getting your specialist your facial identification expert your forensic artist to say okay who's most likely and then it, it, it just kind of goes from there uh, facial uh, software composite programs you know, if you get a person who only saw um, the suspect from a profile view or three-quarter view, software program can't do that. Forensic artists can. Um, so, but if you look at where it's going, I look at the, I look personally at the forensic artists as, as being the, um, the quality assurance persons. Um, I think that we're going to be better at catching more crooks and safeguarding our communities if more people are involved. Um, I always tell people, you know, when they train with our facial composite software, SketchCop, it's okay, so when you put it into Photoshop or you put it into GIMP, whatever, you know, all of us love drawing as a child. All of us love picking up doodling. You know, grab into your inner childhood and, 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 and create a layer and go to work on that sketch. Just a little bit, you don't have to do a lot of drawing, just a little bit of tweaking here and there. And, um, the facial composite artists, the forensic artists of the future are really going to be, I look at it as being there, we're going to create a new class of forensic facial identification specialists. who are going to be good at all those things. And, and again, they won't have a digital solution, an AI solution for everything, like, for example, facial reconstruction. Um, but they probably will someday. So those of you who are getting involved in the game right now, who maybe have some artistic skills, you've got some you know, better than average computer skills, and you know how to work and you're comfortable working in software environments, great. You know, if you have artistic talent, even better. If you're a forensic artist, you know, obviously keep increasing your skills, but keep increasing your knowledge about these different software programs, these different technologies. So when your department decides to you know, invest in a software program, invest in the technology, you get to be the one to lead it. This is one of the reasons why I created a, a facial composite software app is because I didn't like what other people were putting out. So I thought if if someone's going to create a software app, it's going to influence the way that forensic artists work, that influence the way that police agencies look at how they create composite sketches. I thought a forensic artist should be the one to lead that technology, lead the development of it. Um, so. Um, 
every technology has come along the way, um, you know, I've, I've tried to find a way to embrace it and or use at least parts or pieces of it um, to, um, you know, to help achieve my goal, which is basically to help police identify someone and lock them up or identify an unidentified murder victim or someone who died uh, natural causes in the street to help police you know, give them back their name. So um, I think it's a bright future. I think it's um, going to be very exciting, uh, probably long after I put down my pencil or my stylus. They're still going to be moving and developing and such. And um, I mean, they're talking about like neural networking where, you know, they attach some electrodes to your head and you think about the suspect and it creates it, you know, from your mind onto the screen. So um, I don't know that it's going to be the minority report type of stuff, but um, it's pretty exciting. So, um, So I think that's it for my presentation. Uh, you can find me on social media at the Sketch Cop Official on Facebook and Instagram. I also have a YouTube channel, Sketch. And if you can find me on, if you're on LinkedIn, you can find me under my professional name, Michael W. Street. So, um, and of course, if you have additional questions, you're uh, welcome to email me directly, Michael at SketchCop.com. So again, I want to thank you for attending. I want to thank uh, Sebastian Kaiser and his staff at Panacea Cooperative Research. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be collaborating with them and uh, they're a bunch of great folks. They've got a great product that um, you'll want to take a look at. So um, I'll give it back to you, Sebastian, uh, and we'll see if we have any questions.